Our salvation depends on one thing. What is that? Ma'am? Well, <laughs> faith in Jesus Christ. Our, our salvation is totally dependent upon our faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, nothing is as important as knowing Christ. Without that, nothing else matters in the least. The Apostle Paul says, compared to knowing Christ, everything else just is garbage. It's a total loss. In the first century, toward the end of the first century, thousands of Jews had been converted to Christ. But there there were some false teachers going around from church to church telling these Jews, you don't need to... Uh, it's all right to, to be a Christian, but you also have to practice these Jewish things. And so the Hebrew writer is writing to the Jewish Christians. And he's telling them, you can't do that. You can't, you can't practice Judaism and Christianity. You can't go both ways. You have to commit totally to Christ. And so we're looking at the book of Hebrews, and we're, the Hebrew writer has one theme, and that is that Jesus is better in every conceivable way. So he's writing this book trying to explain to them some Jewish things. This book is a little weird for us because we don't have a Jewish background. It's really weird how things work, but this week I got a phone call from a guy Really nice guy. He doesn't come to church, but he studies his Bible all the time. He calls me about twice every month and has for years. And we have long discussions about the Bible. He loves to talk about the Bible. And so help me, <laughs> this week he called me. It was like Monday. He calls me and says, Steve, he says, I'm studying this passage in Hebrews, which is the passage we're going to look at tonight. <laughs> And he says, is something wrong with me? <laughs> he says, I don't understand it. <laughs> so uh, we're going to try to go through this passage because unless you come at it from the right angle, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I mean, it is totally Jewish. And to us, there's very little in it. That's, it now, the, the, the premise is, is still for us that nothing else can replace Christ. We, we are in danger when we let something else <laughs> replace Christ. But these Jewish Christians were tending, tending to go back into Judaism. And he starts off in chapter 1 by saying, Jesus is greater than the prophets. Who are the prophets in his thinking? He says they're messengers from God. They speak for God. They're great people, but they're still messengers. They don't have a. They they didn't originate the truth. They just rep, they just repeat the truth. Jesus is greater because he's not a messenger. He's God himself. He's the origin of the truth. And then he says in chapter two, or at the end of chapter one in chapter two, Jesus is greater than the angels. Now to the Jews, angels were supernatural beings. He says, but Jesus is even greater than they are because the angels are servants. Jesus is creator. He made the angels. He created the angels. They serve him and even us. And so Jesus is far superior to the angels. Now, for, for 11 chapters, he's going to build this case. Point after point after point after point. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And so he starts off by saying Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than the angels. He said, and then he gives some severe warnings. He says, do not drift away from the truth. Don't drift back into Judaism and lose your, your soul. And then last week we saw in chapter 3, he says, Jesus is even greater than Moses. Now to the Jews, Moses was the lawgiver. 
He was the deliverer. He led them out of slavery in Egypt. Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses was a servant in God's house. Jesus owns the house. <laughs> so who's greater, the owner of the house or the servant in the house? Well, obviously the owner is greater. Then he gives another warning. He says, don't be like your not headed forefathers who got in the desert and complained and rebelled against God and they didn't get to go into Canaan because of their rebellion. Don't be like them. Don't, don't go there. Your forefathers made this foolish choice to rebel against God and they didn't get to go into Canaan. And then he, he draws it from that. He says, don't miss the rest. There's a better rest in Christ. And that's what we were looking at last week. He says, your forefathers didn't get to go into the rest of Canaan, the Sabbath of Canaan. They didn't get to go to Canaan because they rebelled. And if you go back into Judaism, you're going to miss the rest that is in Christ. What rest is he talking about? Now, what's the rest that the Jews would miss now? Resting from uh, the regulations. The regulations. We, we, we rest from having to earn our salvation. We rest from guilt. What happens to our sins? What sins? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What sins? <laughs> Christian has no sins. They've been removed. So you and I can rest from the guilt of sin. We can rest from worry because we know that if we drop dead today, what happens? We go to heaven. So he's saying, you Jews that are going back into Judaism, you're going to miss the rest in Christ. He says, That's, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that at all. We now come to the end of chapter 3 and start in chapter 4. And this is the most difficult section of this book. And like I said, if you don't know a little bit about the Judaistic system, uh, this passage doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm going to do a little bit of background today to help us get what... Now, a lot of this is going to refer to the temple, to the worship of the temple. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was the center of worship for the Jews. All the Jews knew about the temple. You've got the, the temple itself here in the middle. <clears throat> And it's got three courtyards around it. This courtyard here where the altar is, where they burn the sacrifices, is called the courtyard of the Jews. This is where the priests offered the animal sacrifices. This courtyard around that courtyard is called the courtyard of the women. Any Jew could go in there, but no Gentile was allowed. <clears throat> Matter of fact, they're at the gates into the courtyard of the women, they have actually, archaeologists have actually found a sign that says any Gentile that passes through this gate can be put to death. That was the one time a, Gentile, a, a person could be executed without the Romans' authority if they tried to pass into the courtyard of the women. This is what they got Paul on. <clears throat> they accused Paul of carrying a Gentile into the courtyard of the women. That's what they, it was a trumped-up charge. It wasn't true, but they accused him of that. And that's what they arrested him on <clears throat> and got him executed. And then beyond that second courtyard... Out here and around the is the courtyard of the Gentiles. Anybody could go into that court. This thing covers acres. I mean, it's huge. Thousands of Jews would be up there. Every Jew knew about this. When you had a sacrifice, you would carry it to the priest and they would offer it on the altar. Now, we're, we're fixing to get into a discussion of priests. And, and from our standpoint we're thinking, what's the big deal? But this is one of his strongest arguments. The Hebrew writer spends more time on this one subject than any other subject in the book of Hebrews. And his main point is, Jesus is a greater high priest than the Jewish system. This would be a big argument to them. So to understand a little bit about the high priest of Israel... This was, a, this was the most important job in the nation. First of all, he must be from the tribe of Levi. How many tribes were there? Thirteen. <laughs> but the Bible never says the thirteen tribes. It always talks about the twelve tribes. Why? 
There were actually 13 tribes. The Lord would not let the Jews count the tribe of Levi. Why? They were set apart for Him. They were to serve Him. They were, so God says you don't count them as one of the tribes, which is weird. Now that 13th tribe, now remember there were 12 sons of Jacob, but there is no tribe of Joseph. Why not? Because God gave Joseph two tribes. His sons became tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So there are actually 13 tribes, but God only says you can count 12. The 13th belongs to me, the tribe of Levi. The priests had to come out of the tribe of Levi. The high priest must be descended from Aaron. Who was Aaron? He was Moses' brother and the first high priest. But every high priest following him had to trace his lineage back to Aaron to be allowed to be the high priest. And he had to be selected by God himself. These were the requirements for the high priest of Israel. Now again, this was the single most important job in the nation. What was he to do that nobody else could do? He was the only one that could go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and where the presence of God was. And he was only allowed to go into that place one day a year, the Day of Atonement. Here's what the high priest normally looked like. He had to wear this garment. and he, The instructions are very explicit about what the garment is to look like. He wore this uh, plate on his chest with 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel and so forth. Now this is the way he normally would dress to do his priestly duties. But on the Day of Atonement, everything was different. He did not wear his pretty garments. He wore white linen. He was specifically instructed on the Day of Atonement, he was to take a bath. He was to dress up in this white garment with the white turban, the white uh, sash. And that's the day he could go into the most holy place. Now, when he would go in, he would select a bull for himself. He had to offer a sacrifice on his own behalf before he could intercede for the Jews. Now, what does the word priest mean? Bridge builder. Bridge builder. Meaning what? He was a bridge between God and man. Under the Jewish system, the Jews could not go directly to God. You couldn't even offer your own sacrifices. You had to take it to the priest. He would offer it for you. And so the high priest was considered to be the ultimate go-between, between between man and God. He was the one who went into the most holy place and offered the sacrifice. But first of all, he had to take a bull. He would kill the bull, slash his throat, catch the blood, carry it into the most holy place, sprinkle the blood on the altar, on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat was the top of the Ark, and this is where God's presence was. He would also select two goats. One of the goats would be for the sins of the people. He would take the, the one selected for the offering. He would cut its throat, take the blood into the... Now this is after he had already done this for himself with the blood of the bull. He would then take the blood of one of the goats, catch it in a cup, take it back into the most holy place place it, sprinkle it on the lid of the holy, on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and this would be for the sins of the people. He would then take the other goat, this is called the scapegoat. He would take his hands and put his hands on the head of the goat and ceremonially place the sins of the people on that goat. And then that goat was led out of the camp and turned loose. Now what's the symbology here? The sins were taken away from the camp. So it's a beautiful symbology. But only the high priest could do these things. He was the one selected to go in the presence of God. Now the Jews would tie 
that they sewed bells into his, the, the hem of his garment. And the theory was, and they would tie a rope to his foot. And the theory was, if he went into the most holy place in the presence of God and angered God, and God struck him down, how would you get him out? See, nobody else could go in. So, if he angered God and God struck him dead, the only way they could get him out is by dragging him out with the rope. History says that, that there's no record that ever happened, but they were prepared for that. As long as they could hear the bells tinkling, then they knew he was, he was not dead. But to the Jews, this was a most important position. I mean, the one guy that is allowed to go into the very presence of God and talk to God and, and offer sacrifice for your sins. Now, the Hebrew writer is going to use this to make his point. And he says, not only is Jesus greater than the prophets, not only is Jesus greater than the angels, not only is Jesus greater than Moses, not only does he provide a better rest, but he's also the greater high priest. Now this would be, so far, his most powerful argument to the Jews. Because if Jesus was greater high priest than even Aaron, then he must be something special. And so he spends more time discussing this than any other subject. But how he does it is amazing to us. I mean, I don't think we, human logic would have ever come up with this. This had to be revealed by God. All right, picking up. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone into heaven... Now, what's the significance here? He went to heaven where the high priest yeah, all the earthly high priests only went into the most holy place. But he's saying Jesus actually went into heaven itself. I mean, that's how great he is. He didn't just go into the temple. He actually went into the courtroom of God Almighty before him and offered the sacrifice of blood. Jesus, the Son of God. He doesn't want them to have any question who he's talking about. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. What's the significance here? He's like us. His whole point is, Jesus came to the earth, and we, we looked at this last week in a previous passage, that Jesus is our brother. He had to take human form. Not only so he could die, but so he could identify with us. He says Jesus has been through everything we've been through. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he had to sleep, he got sick in his stomach, he, you know, he, he, did, he, he was even tempted like we are. And so he's saying Jesus is a greater high priest because he's gone through everything we have, but he's also the Son of God. He's able to sympathize. Now, how did the Jews look at God? Fear. God was a fearsome God. They, they thought of God as, uh, as basically unapproachable because you have to go through the priest to get to God. You don't just go to God. You don't just offer your own sacrifices. You have to go through the high priest. You have to go through the priests. And if you saw God, what would happen? You would die. I mean, every one of them believed if we saw God, we would be dead. There were several times when angels would appear to someone and the guy said, Oh, I'm going to die. <laughs> so uh, th this was a scary. So Jesus came to the earth. And one of his roles was he says, if you want to see God, what? Look at me. Jesus says, you want to see God. You've always wanted to see God. You're scared to death to see God. Okay, look at me. You can see God. So this was a big deal. And so this writer is going to make a huge argument out of all these things that Jesus Christ is the greatest because he's even greater than the greatest of the high priest because he's the son of God. He's gone through all this stuff. He continues... He's been tempted in every way, just as we are. But what's the difference? He, didn't, he never sinned. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now that's a totally new idea to the Jews. What's the closest the average Jew could even get to God? 
the courtyard. <laughs> he wasn't even allowed into the first of the holy places, much less the holy places, the most holy place. The closest any Jew could get, any Jewish male, would be that first courtyard around the altar. The women couldn't even get into that. And so he's saying, now, you Jews who are Christians, you can approach God's throne itself. You can go right into the presence of God Almighty with that confidence. You don't have to be afraid God's going to strike you dead so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So he's saying Jesus is far superior to the Old Testament priesthood because in every way he's done better. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts, sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins. So the high priest himself had to offer sacrifices because he was a sinner. He's saying, now Jesus is not a sinner, but he's human. And he is able to go to God, before God, represent us to God on our behalf. He, uh, he offered sins for the people. Now he's going to throw us a curveball. And when you first time you ever read this, you say, what has this got to do with anything? <laughs> No one takes this honor upon himself. You didn't, you didn't decide to be the high priest. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. What does that mean, he didn't take upon himself? How did he get to be high priest? God appointed him. That was one of his jobs to come, not only to be our Savior, but to be the high priest. We don't usually talk about this a lot. This idea of Jesus as our high priest, we know that, but we don't really think about it much, and what does that really mean? But God said to him, you are my son. Now remember, what is son? Title. Title. This was introduced back in chapter 1. He says, Jesus is greater than the angels because he is son. He's the heir. He's God himself. Today I have become your father, meaning I have appointed you to this job. And he says in another place, now here is where you think, what? <laughs> you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And you think, what's that got to do with anything? Why in the world would he throw this guy in? Melchizedek is only mentioned once in Scripture, or twice in the Old Testament, and then once here. And he was a very minor character. Now what happened? Who, who is Melchizedek? He loved, loved the, uh, Abraham, okay, back in Genesis... 14, Abraham's nephew Lot was living in Sodom. And five kings from the east across on the other side of Canaan got together and got an army up and they swept through southern Canaan. And they conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the south. And they carried off Lot and his family and Lot's goods as, as spoils. Abraham got his servants together. He must have had a lot of servants. <laughs> and they chased them down and had a big battle. And Abraham's forces, with God's help, defeated the armies of these five kings. And on the way home, Abraham is passing by a little town called Salem that later on would become Jerusalem. And so when he passed by this Salem, it was a small village in those days, there was a king of this town by the name of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the king of the town, but he was also the priest of the town. 
Now, why is that unusual? Very rarely does a person serve in both capacities. And under the Jewish system, it can't be done. Why? Because the priests had to come out of what tribe? Levi. The kings had to come out of what tribe? Judah. And so the same guy could not hold both titles. It's not possible under the Jewish system. And so the Hebrew writer is going to make an argument saying Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. He's not saying that Jesus is like Melchizedek. He's saying his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, Jesus doesn't fit into the Jewish priesthood system. Jesus is something new. He's something different. His priesthood is more comparable to Melchizedek's priesthood because Jesus is both priest and king. Now, Jesus came from the tribe of what? Judah. So he could not ever qualify to be a priest under the Jewish system. He was not from the right tribe. Jesus could not be a high priest under the Jewish system. So this priesthood has to change. We're going to see that later on in the book. He makes the argument about that. Jesus is not of the tribe of Levi. He can't be a priest in the Judaistic system. So the Hebrew writer is saying something brand new has shown up. Jesus Christ is also, he's king and high priest. Something new has arisen. And this makes him better. He can fulfill both functions. So that's what this Melchizedek thing is all about. It, it's not meant to be taken beyond what he's... Now, the other weird thing about this, and this is where we don't really understand, or where we get our brains all clogged up. My great-great-grandfather, uh, the records of his birth and death are both missing. They were burned up in a fire or lost or something. So if I said to you, well, my great-grandfather was really never born and he never died, what would you say? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't make any sense to us. Obviously, if the man existed, he was born and he died. But the Hebrew writer is going to make the argument we don't have a record of Melchizedek's birth or his death. Therefore, he was never born and he never died. <laughs> That's why I said this passage is so difficult because it doesn't make sense to us. But to the Jews, this makes perfect sense. Because to the Jews, you had to be able to produce your records. If you couldn't produce your records, then you could literally not say, I was born. I'm standing here before you, but I wasn't born because I don't have any records. To be a priest, any priest, you had to have your credentials. You had to have your records. You had to be able to prove, okay, I descended from the tribe of Levi. Matter of fact, when the Jews came back from captivity in Babylon after 70 years, some of the priests could not produce their birth records. So what happened to them? They could not be priests. They were not allowed to serve as priests simply because they couldn't produce their records. So the Jews understood this. Without the records, you can't claim that you were ever born. <laughs> and you can't claim that you died. <laughs> Your ancestors can't claim you died. We don't have any proof of that. We don't have any records of that. And so the Hebrew writer is going to make an argument off of this. And to us... We think, well, that's nuts. Surely he, we know he was born. We know he died. But the Hebrew writer is going to say, Jesus is like Melchizedek in what sense? Jesus wasn't born in what sense? Yeah, yeah Jesus, Jesus has always existed. He's God. He didn't have an origin. Now, he inhabited a human baby to start as a human, but as far as his origin, where was his origin? He's infinite God. What does the word I am mean? The always existing one. God's name is not God. God's name is I am. And it means the always existing one. 
God has always existed. Jesus is God. Jesus has always existed. He never had a starting point. So in that sense, he's like Melchizedek. Now the Hebrew writer is not saying that Melchizedek was never born. What's he saying? They don't have a record. We don't have a record. <laughs> yes. Priest and a king. Now he was not a Jew. Okay. I, I, I'm, I've got to say that. Melchizedek was not Jewish. Okay. But he served as a priest and king of Salem. But he, he didn't come up under the Jewish system. So that's <laughs> well. There were other priests, uh, men who voluntarily served God, but didn't come out of the Jewish system. Plus, this is before Judaism actually started. This is back in the days of Abraham. Yeah, he was a patriarch. Yeah, he was under that patriarchal system. So when you're reading through this passage and you read about Melchizedek, that's what the whole argument is about. He's saying, okay, Melchizedek was a priest and a king. We have no record of his birth, no record of his death. Therefore, you can't really say he was born and died. Now, the point of all that is, Jesus has those characteristics. Since Jesus is God, he didn't have an origin point. And where is Jesus now? He's living in heaven. He's never going to die. So, in the sense, he's like Melchizedek. He's never born. He's never going to die. How's that different from the other high priests? They all die. Every one of them. But Jesus will never die. So when you're reading through this, and you're thinking, what in the world's going on? That's, he, he, he's drawing a very obscure point here that, that we don't normally think of. So when Abraham came back, here's Abraham. When Abraham was leading the forces back home, he came by the king, the king came out to meet him, and he paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Now again, this is going to be an argument he's going to use that just makes very little sense to us. Alright, so he says Jesus' priesthood is not like the Aaronic priesthood. It's on the order of Melchizedek. It's after Melchizedek. Now, he doesn't mean he's descended from Melchizedek. He doesn't mean Melchizedek was some supernatural being. It just means his priesthood is different from the Aaronic priesthood. Like I said, this is found in Genesis 14. If you want to go home and read that, it might help you understand what's going on. Melchizedek was priest and king, king of Salem. Abraham paid him a tithe of everything he collected from the kings. Now, what's the significance of paying someone a tithe? Who pays a tithe? Uh, an inferior. Uh, the lesser pays the greater. Well, the Hebrew writer is going to make an argument off of that as well. <laughs> as great as Abraham was, he paid the tithe to Melchizedek. Okay, so the writer continues. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. When did he do that? When did he offer up prayers and petitions? When he was in the garden. Yeah, the Bible says he was so distressed, said he was to the point of dying, and he had bloody sweat coming off... And so he's saying Jesus, and what did Jesus pray to God? If there's any possible way, don't make me go through this. Did Jesus know he had to do it? Yes. But it was going to be so horrible because he was going to be separated from God while he was on the cross. He knew God was going to have to leave him for several hours and for an infinite personality. To be separated from God for a few hours would be like one of us being separated from God forever. Jesus knew. It wasn't the nails. That wasn't the, that wasn't the bad thing about the crucifixion. It was the separation. Matter of fact, what did he cry out on the cross? Why have you forsaken me? He didn't say, why do I have to un, you know, go through the, the cross itself? Yes. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> that has caused a lot of uh, wondering. Yeah, Martin Luther uh, read this section, and he was said to have looked at it for an hour, just sat there. Finally, he got up and said, God forsaking God, who can comprehend that? And he's right, yeah. So why would Jesus... See, this is Jesus' humanity talking. It's his, it's his weak self. That's God, if there's any way. But ultimately, what did he say? But your will, not mine. I mean, he knew it was going to have to happen. But he was, he was so dreading the cross. I don't think we will ever appreciate what Jesus really went through for us. The cross was a lot worse than just the pain of the nails. I mean, a lot of Christians were, sac were crucified. And many of them lasted longer than Jesus did. And a lot of them were singing songs as they died. So it wasn't the cross itself that Jesus dreaded. It was the separation from his Father. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why did God forsake Jesus? He had to. Because Jesus literally became sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians says that God took all the sins of mankind and put them on Jesus. Well, when Jesus became sin, what did God have to do? He had to leave him. God cannot tolerate sin. And so for six hours, Jesus was separated from his Father. All right, so it says, He offered prayers and loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect. Now, this is also hard for us to bend our minds around. We think of Jesus as automatically perfect. What does it mean he was made perfect? We thought he was already perfect. Yes. Jesus had to qualify to be the sacrifice. How was he able to qualify? Because he led a sinless life. That's why he had to come and live for 30 years, 33 years before he went to the cross. He couldn't come one day and be sacrificed the next. He had to qualify. We, this is hard for us to bend our minds around. Jesus Christ had to qualify to be our sacrifice. And this passage is teaching by his obedience to, even though he said, I don't want to do it, he still did it. And so he qualified himself to be our perfect sacrifice so God would accept his blood for our sins. And so <laughs> this goes back to the passage earlier where it said Jesus went into heaven. He took his own blood. Now, what did the high priest do? The blood of the bull. Jesus takes his own blood into the most holy place in heaven and offers it for us. Yes. 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 He was the scapegoat. He was the sacrifice. His own blood paid for our sins. <clears throat> but he had to qualify by going through all this. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was des designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now you come back to his argument. And he's saying Jesus is the king, but he's also the high priest. So he has a dual function. And so to these Jews who are hearing this, what are they hearing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If all these high priests were so wonderful... But Jesus is even greater than they are. He must be something special. First. Yeah, we're going to get to that next time. But yeah, you're right. He's going to make the argument that, yeah, that Levi paid a tithe through Abraham. <laughs> we'll talk about how, why that's such a weird concept. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's amazing the, the way he works all this through, but it's unbelievable the theology here. But the more you understand this, the more you appreciate what Jesus actually went through. Let's pray, please. Our God and our Father, please help us to understand these great truths 
so that we can get to know Jesus, so that we can appreciate what He's done. Father, we know that our salvation is found in Him and Him alone. And if we do anything to move away from Christ, if we leave Him in any way, that we are endangering our souls. Father, give each of us the strength to hold on to our faith in Christ and what He's done and to appreciate the great truths that we're reading and studying. Father, a lot of these things are difficult for us. And we pray for understanding. We pray for wisdom. And Father, help us to follow Jesus our whole lives and to never give up. For it's in His name we pray. Amen.